Okay, and our transcription's going? Okay, cool. Um, so the first person I'm gonna introduce is Kelly Wooten, who is our neighbor down the road at Duke University. Kelly is the research services and collection development librarian at the Sally Bingham Center for Women's History and Culture in the Rubenstein Library and sexuality studies librarian for Duke University Library. In these, these roles, she offers reference and research help instruction sessions and outreach for women's and LGBTQ history collections. She also curates scenes, artist books by women and materials documenting modern feminist activism. She's co-editor of Make Your Own History, documenting feminist and queer activism in the 21st century. She's active in the Zine Librarians community and incoming chair of the Diversity Committee of the Society for American Archivists. Prior to coming to Duke, Kelly was the public relations and annual giving coordinator for UNC's Health Science Library. She received both her BA in Women's Studies in English Literature and an MSLS from the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill. And uh, I will say I met Kelly Wooten five years ago at the Archives Leadership Institute in Berea, Kentucky. And it happened to be the week before I was having surgery for cancer and we hung out with bell hooks. And the magic of all of that meant that we had to be friends for life. Um, and Kelly was generous enough to introduce me to Milo Miller, um, who's also joining us tonight. And I'm so excited to meet you, Milo, because I use your... Um, Queer Zine Archive, Archive Project all the time in teaching, and I research with it a lot. It's so amazing. Milo Miller is an active zine maker and the co-founder of the Queer, Queer Zine Archive Project. Beginning with their earliest scenes in 1992, their work is a playful lens on queer culture, media, and current events. They've produced several serial zines, Nikita's Booth, Mutate, Gendercide, Grumpy Pumpy, I love, I was like, I'm really excited to read these aloud. Um, I hope that's okay. And a number of standalone zines, including the cook zine, Bananarchy Now, Us Amazonians, a Percy McCall fanzine, Big Zine, Little Zine, and several others. Cues Out began in, in 2003 as a way of providing activists a way uh, to access information published in queer zines through digitized copies in an online archive. Milo's current work with the archive focuses on the importance of the stories and narratives that are told through zines in ways and about subjects that are rarely discussed in other forms of queer media. Currently, Milo lives in the River West neighborhood of Milwaukee, where they plot nonviolent revolution around a boomerang for mica table with their nesting partner in crime, the cats they co-parent, and their pet rock, Nigel. And finally, I'm really, really excited to introduce um, Micah Bazant. I actually learned about Micah through our dear student Faith Miner who's on, on this Zoom. Um, and Faith found Micah's zine Tim Tum and it has absolutely changed their life. So um, we're really excited that Micah can join us. Micah Bazant is a transgender visual artist who works in social justice movements to reimagine the world. They create art inspired by struggles to decolonize ourselves from white supremacy, patriarchy, ableism, and the gender binary. Bazant is the author of several zines, including Tim Tum, and their artwork has been exhibited and published internationally. Bazant's work is grounded in ethical models of collaboration and cultural reparations, transforming the dominant narratives about marginalized communities and winning material change. And um, I'm hoping that Micah can share uh, some of their, their art that they've done since Tim Tom, but I highly recommend that you visit the sites on, um, uh, that are linked to the lib guide and look at all of the art because it's just phenomenal. So I'm gonna, at this point, stop talking and pass it over to my dear friend, Kelly Wooten. Hi, <laughs> I've been joined by Rosie. Um, I had closed the door to keep cats and children out of the room and a child um, opened the door and let Rosie in. So here she is. <laughs> Thank you so much, Libby, for that introduction. Uh, it's always funny to hear the little professional bio. I'm thankfully outgoing chair of the diversity committee, so I'm not 
chair of any committee right now and it's literally the best. So um, <laughs> those other things are still mostly true. <laughs> All right. So um, I was going to um, just do like a really quick, like my life and zines um, and then kind of uh, wrap that up before I hand it over to Milo. So, um, so a lot of y'all are students at Elon. I grew up in Burlington, North Carolina. Um, my mom still lives there and um, I visit often. <laughs> um, so uh, I really don't have any idea how I found out about zines because like if Burlington's not like super cool now, it was like even less cool <laughs> in the 90s when I was in high school. I went to Williams High School, which is on Church Street. And I, uh, when uh, Libby moved to Burlington, I, I feel like I made you a little drawing or like a little tour of like all my old old haunts, <laughs> including where the high school is. So um, I don't know how I found out what a zine was, but um, I must have seen it in a magazine or maybe like a friend um, found out about them who was cooler than me. Um, so uh, my friend Tara Brown and I uh, made a zine. It might have been sassy. I didn't get sassy. I don't know. I did get YM. Surely there weren't zines in, in YM anyway. Um, but my friend Tara and I uh, made a super embarrassing zine. It's at the Bingham Center if you want to come see how embarrassing it was. It was called Real, the zine for people who are, which is um, embarrassing and hilarious to me <laughs> now, but kind of gives you a sense of what was going on um, with my teenage high school um, angsty self. So I made about, I don't know, 10 or 20 copies on the copying machine, which was in the back of my dad's appliance store, Wooten Appliance, RIP, and um, maybe gave it to a few friends. But um, I just remember how fun it was to be um, in our bedroom, uh, like making, like cutting and pasting and feeling like we were doing something like really cool and subversive and writing under pseudonyms and we're going to hand them out in high school and just be really cool zine people. But um, after that, I didn't really do much with them. I didn't really connect with the zine community. Um, there, I don't even think there was a record store in Burlington. There used to be one in Elon on the main drag. Maybe he doesn't like being that. But um, I didn't really reconnect with zines until um, I was in graduate school in the um, early 2000s. And um, Sarah Dyer had just placed her zine collection at the Sally Bingham Center at Duke. So I was in school at UNC Chapel Hill for library science. And um, Sarah Dyer, who did a, a review zine called Action Girl, guide and also Action Girl Comics, which we don't have any copies of. We have maybe have one issue, but I'll I'll come I'll come to that because I read I read them all in, in my was basement <laughs> a few years ago. Anyway, um she was based in New York and she had started collecting zines by women and girls um uh in the early 90s when um she was involved kind of like in the punk scene and music scene and um, folks were, she was experiencing kind of erasure of her own voice and agency in the publications she was creating. So she would create a zine, draw comics, write it, publish it, do, do all the work and, you know, maybe have like a, a male friend or two contribute to it. And then people would say, oh, this guy put this scene together, not, not Sarah. So she started doing like all female publications um, and looking for other women and girls who are creating zines. And um, that kind of became the core of the Bingham Center zine collections. Um, Jenny Daly was the first women's studies archivist at Duke. And she, I found these really awesome files when we moved our offices like from the 90s of her emailing like old listservs like printouts of like on dot matrix printer from these old listservs like mid 90s like trying to figure out how to collect zines in libraries um which is was not possible <laughs> at the time but she kind of had this thought and i found some 
communication between her and Sarah Dyer. So later when Sarah was ready to make a placement, she got back in touch with the Bingham Center. So um, in graduate school, I made every excuse to go visit the zine collection at the Sally Bingham Center, um, including writing term papers and my master's paper about the collection, which um, uh, it turns out to be a really good way to get a job like four or five years later. Um, so now I curate the zines at the Bingham Center. It's still predominantly women and girls, but gender inclusive and expansive. Um, there's, you know, folks from every identity in that collection, including a, a wonderful little collection by a, a person named uh, Niku, who is here tonight, <laughs> um, which is a great little I keep saying little, it's, a, it's, a, it's one of the smaller collections, but it's small but mighty. It has like a lot of really great Southern zines and like media creation zines and stuff in it. So it's exciting to see you. Um, so doing this zine work at the library, I was still kind of just doing it on my own until I found out about the zine librarians community, which is how I um, met and connected with Milo. And again, I felt like I was just sort of on my own and not very cool, cool or interesting. And I was kind of afraid or maybe a little intimidated by um, the other folks doing zine library work. And I remember learning about QZAP and thinking it was such an incredible project and um, uh, just kind of blown away by how like radical it seemed to me from like being in a academic special collections library setting and then seeing this independent project that was kind of like creating their own space to share cuisines. Um, so uh, I'm gonna do, I'm gonna, sorry, there's someone yelling in the background because they're kids and family people in my home that are like dealing with dinner stuff. So I'm a little distracted. But um, I kind of want to transition into talking about the Zine Librarians community, particularly Milo, um, uh, who I believe we first met in person in 2014 when you came to the Durham um, Zine Librarians Unconference, um, which I'd never been able to attend. So I decided to host it at Duke so I could get to go. Um, but um, I, I was a little bit wait, like nervous to meet all the like super cool zine librarian folks and they just all were so warm and friendly and fun and goofy and had a wonderful sense of humor and um, did you and Kelly McElroy make the bingo sheet? Are you the bingo person? Do you know? <laughs> yes. So um, I feel like Milo and the other zine librarians have inspired me to be like more creative and joyful and like embrace that kind of wacky sense of humor that a lot of us <laughs> sometimes have um, in our work, which is not something you normally get to do in boring libraries, right Libby? <laughs> um, at least it's not really encouraged. So. Um, yeah, I really have, uh, through zine librarians particularly, have learned so much more about the ways we can center creators and honor their intentions in our collections and um, engage with the materials in a more personal and personalized way, like connecting students with the creators and helping them imagine other ways of being. I work with Duke students, it's a pretty homogenous population. And um, I've been really lucky to work with a lot of writing classes that are interested in zines. Um, I have taught with Tim Tum, um, Micah Zine. Um, I started working with um, that in particular with one of these classes I got to work with on trans and queer memoir, which was just incredible to be able to engage first year students at Duke on trans issues and looking at trans scenes and um, exposing them to different places. So um, yeah, zines have really expanded my idea about you know, what is scholarship, what is community, what does it mean to be an ethical librarian and collector and curator and describer of materials. Um, 
Myler was someone who worked on the um, uh, Zine Librarian's Code of Ethics, and I think that their uh, approach to digitization with Q's app has been really um, important in setting the tone going forward as more materials are being digitized and people are demanding broader access. So yeah, I'm super happy to be here and love to be in conversation with folks who are inspired and inspiring. And I'll hand it over to Myra. Thanks, Kelly. Um, I think I feel so sort of thrilled that you said that about um, us being, you know, taking an ethical leadership role in digitization because I feel like my first interactions with you were virtual because you had written an essay about why Duke was not digitizing things. And I, you know, and it was like, wait, we're diametrically opposed, but also we've become really, really great friends. And so um, I just, I really love that a lot. Um, so my background with making zines and being an activist um, sort of also goes back to the early nineties. Uh, in the summer of 1991 and through throughout the 90s and even through the present, um, fundamentalist Christians have been targeting abortion clinics in Milwaukee, um, harassing patients, harassing doctors. It's an ongoing thing um, that of course now is happening at a legislative level. And so it used to be people just being jerks to folks who are trying to get access to health services and now it's governors and Supreme Court justices. And so, you know, that was a big thing. Um, at the time, it was right after my grandfather had died. And so my dad was going back to synagogue every week. Uh, and while he was doing that was when Operation Rescue first started to come to Milwaukee. and. So my dad would come back from Shabbat services and one night he said that the rabbi had given a sermon about that this was happening and our values as Jews made it imperative that we work to keep the clinics open. So from that, my whole family got involved in doing clinic defense. Um, I was getting ready to be a senior in high school. My sister was getting ready to be a sophomore in high school. Um, through doing clinic defense, I ended up meeting a bunch of folks and got involved with ACT UP. Um, and this was the summer of before my senior year of high school and into my senior year of high school. Um, and Deanna, one of the folks from ACT UP Milwaukee um, is I think probably the person who gave me my first zine. Um, but I started going to ACT UP meetings I ended up becoming an AIDS activist. Um, I fought my high school to get better sex ed. Um, at the same time, I was also totally still a high school student and um, luckily living in a big enough city of Milwaukee. Um, we actually in the 90s had a pretty vibrant uh, underage club scene. So, you know, 15 up dance clubs. Um, and through clubbing, I ended up meeting uh, my friend B, who helped me. Together, we put out Nikita's Boot, which is the first zine that I put out. Um, and when Kelly was talking about Cringeworthy, um, a couple of years ago, we ended up getting back together and becoming friends through the power of the internet. And he gave me all of the original paste ups that his mom had saved from the summer, you know, from 1992 and 93. Um, and so I'm putting in the chat my first zine, um, which is super cringe. And also I look at the work that I do now and in my day job, when I'm not working on QZAP stuff, I'm a graphic designer and I'm like, oh my goodness, I've come so far. And so through zines, I'm able to see this 30 year history of my own aesthetics and values and whatnot. Um, at any rate, fast forward through university, I did not do much with zines um, when I was in college. Um, I worked on the school art magazine for uh, a year or so, um, but then I graduated and I moved back from Westchester, New York to Milwaukee 
Um, and I was dating somebody and our relationship ended, but um, she really encouraged me to start making zines again. And at the time I was like, I'm the loneliest queer punk in Milwaukee. There's nobody else who's out and bisexual and, you know, sort of gender variant, you know, and I didn't have a language for it at the time. Um, but, uh, but she really encouraged me. And so I started making Mutate, uh, which was the next serial zine that I did. Um, and that was in 1999. Um, and at the same time um, that I was doing that, the internet was really in its 1.0, you know, sort of heyday. Um, and so I was making zines. I was on a queer punk listserv email list um, where people would post about shows, they'd post about their bands, they'd post tour info. Um, we'd send zines around that way. Um, news groups were really a big thing and they weren't completely overrun with spam and porn and things like that. Um, and so I would post stuff on alt zines kind of on the regular whenever I put out a new issue. Um, and so I was doing all of that. And then I moved to California. Um, and while I was in California, I was still making mutate. Um, and I was out one night uh, at a party. And when I was coming home, I ended up getting queer bashed. And it sucked. Um, it wasn't the worst thing in the world, but also it totally sucked. Uh, and um, the next day I had heard about uh, an organizing meeting for Queer, Queer Eruption, which had been an ongoing series of international gatherings of radical queers, anarchists, punks. Um, and in 2001, it was happening in San Francisco and Berkeley and in Oakland. Um, so I got involved doing organizing and at the first organizing meeting, I met this guy which sometimes happens. Um, and we started dating and then we broke up, uh, but we have not stopped talking for 20 years. And he's currently upstairs playing with the cats. Um, and so at any rate, we were starting to date and we were all goofy and whatever. Um, and so uh, we would be sitting in these organizing meetings and conversations would be happening sort of around us. Um, sex, drugs, rock and roll, racism, accessibility, um, you know, planning sex parties, talking about safer sex, talking about what to do with the folks who are gonna show up who say that HIV does not equal AIDS, all of it. Um, and he had also been a zine maker, is a zine maker. Um, and so either after the meetings or during the meetings, we'd look at each other and we'd be like, wait, didn't so-and-so write about this in such and such zine? And, you know, at this point we'd been making, I'd been making zines for three or four years. He'd been making zines for close to a decade. Um, our friend, Larry Bob Roberts, who put out the seminal zine, Holy Tit Clamps and Queer Zine Explosion was one of the other organizers. Um, and of course with Queer Zine Explosion, Larry Bob had this complete whole running history for at the time there were 17 or 18 issues out of all of the queer zines that he had gotten since the really early 90s. Um, but we had this idea that, hey, we've collected all of these zines and there's all sorts of information in them uh, related to activism and related to what it means to be queer. But there are zines, what do we do with this? How do we, how do we get this out into people's you know, headspace so that we don't necessarily have to go to organizing meetings and reinvent the wheel for the first three hours of every meeting. Um, so fast forward another couple of years, I end up, had ended up leaving California and moving back to Milwaukee where I'd grown up. Um, Chris ended up following me out here. Um, and so we thought, hey, why don't we really make a push and see if we can figure out how to start something where people have access to zines online. Um, and we were talking about it, we were talking about it over the summer because he's been busy writing a paper 
um, talking about zine, queer zines um, and queer publication history. Um, and from my perspective, thinking of it as a timeline, I would say that there was a whole lot that was happening at the turn of the millennia. But really for us, um, I think the Battle of Seattle um, and the anti-WTO protests combined with queer option, which started in 1998, um, was the first year in London, and then it moved to Dumba uh, in Brooklyn, and then into the Bay Area, and then continued out through the beginning part of the 2000s, um, Berlin and Sydney and Tel Aviv and um, Barcelona and, um, but like, I think, now that we've had a chance to really sort of lay it out there, we're using that as sort of a starting point of here's activists doing work, creating media um, in a way that hadn't really been created before. Um, indie media as a concept sort of blew up then. Um, there was a lot of stuff floating around about making your own pirate radio and television stations. Um, and zines really fell into that for us. Um, and so initially we really thought about them as activist tools. Um, what I have discovered over almost 20 years of being a community archivist is that they are activist tools, but that's not all that they are, um, which I'll get to in just a second. So, um, so we started up QZAP um, and we were looking around and we were trying to figure out what to model it off of. And we knew about info shops. Um, we knew about the anarchist bookstores that were around the country. Um, places like ABC No Rio, uh, Bound Together. Um, and then there was Zap, the zine archive publishing project that had existed in Seattle for a really long time. Um, and so there were some models of independent spaces that were holding zines um, and you know they would have reading rooms or sort of library spaces um, but nobody was they were all very regional uh, and so with QZAP our idea was we are very much part of an international queer community of folks who are working locally but sharing a lot of the same values, a lot of the same ideas. Hey, this internet thing, it's new. It seems to be sticking around. Um, how do we share stuff? And so now I sometimes joke that we were Google Books before Google had an idea. Um, but uh, that's really sort of how we got started. And since then we've grown a lot. Um, numerically we started with about 350 zines um now we're upwards of 2500 maybe close to 3000 um neither one of us are librarians so we don't actually have a catalog or account like we just when we started we weren't thinking about that and we've been trying in the last couple of years to bolt that on sort of after the fact um i think one of the things that really has helped us to do what we do um, and you know I think one of the most important things is that we are absolutely of the community that we are archiving and so we have this real we've built up this real level of trust with the folks who donate to us and the folks who you know, in professional library speak, we would call patrons. Um, but, you know, folks contact us kind of regularly and, you know, our bona fides are that we're queer punks that have been doing this for a really long time. And we want to do right by the folks who are putting material out there. Um, as I mentioned, I think, for myself, my narrative around QZAP has really changed a lot, um, especially within the last decade or so, because I think all of the activist information that we have in our collection 
is really, really important. Looking at stuff from ACT UP, looking at some of the, um, over the summer I wrote a, a blog post about um, all of the women's health zines that we have, uh, you know, for do-it-yourself abortion access um, and just women's health in general, sexual health in general, super, super important materials. But more important than that are the people who make the materials and the stories that they tell. Um, and when we look, you know, with some perspective at queer media and what has changed and what really has not changed, it's a question of what stories get told and who's telling them. Um, and for us, zines are so amazingly powerful because, you know, in even as far back as the 1980s, you could pick up a copy of The Advocate or Deneuve, which became Curve. Um, you, you know, you could stumble across, depending on where you lived and what your market was, maybe a cable access show that talked about LGBT issues. Um, but by and large, most of the lesbian and gay media, and I use those terms pretty specifically, are hegemonic um, and they help to prop up a narrative of a lesbian and gay capitalism that is fairly white, um, fairly privileged, um, you know, with ties to entertainment, ties to pharmaceutical industries, especially around the AIDS crisis. Um, when we write stories that are not about that, they disappear for the most part. And that's why zines are so fucking cool and powerful is because I look around the room at this collection of material that has you know, come to us in little tiny pieces, um, drips and drabs, and then in larger collections. And you know, seeing all of these stories that are so different from what we hear um, and being able to read about, um, and one of the zines that I talk about often is, um, there's a zine called uh, Tazewell's Favorite it's Eccentric from Tazewell, West Virginia. Um, and, you know, the first time I got that, we looked it up on a map and I was like, well, shit, there are queers in that tiny little West Virginia town that are putting out zines? Yes, yes, please. You know, um, coming across stories from international communities where folks are doing similar types of activist work um, and, you know, being able to read honest stories about people who are doing sex work and really liking it and, you know, having this break a narrative that we've constantly told about, you know, how unfortunate it is that people have to turn to prostitution and like all of that gets thrown out the window when you can actually read things in their, you know, by people from their own words. Um, so that for me, that's really been hugely important to sort of shift my focus to thinking and talking about how every zine in our collection is so vitally important because it represents somebody who is coming from a place that I might be coming from. Um, we were doing a project a couple of years ago uh, with Joyce Latham, who is, uh, she was a library instructor at UW-Milwaukee. Um, she recently retired and is now, I think, teaching a single class um, at Champaign-Urbana. Um, and Joyce is sort of an old school lesbian, um, definitely in her sixties, you know, a generation older than, than we are. Um, and we were, her focus was on QZAP and uh, on language specifically. And she was trying to understand why QZAP was important and why the zines were important. And, um, we'd been working together and we had a research meeting with, um, with her graduate student uh, 
who has also been a zine maker and a you know a big supporter of QZAP. And just being able to see her light bulb moment, Joyce's light bulb moment of, oh, I get it. Your archive is where folks come to find stories about themselves. And you know, since that happened, I've not been able to think about anything else because I think that really sums up a lot of the type of work that we do. Um, and just having that recognition and being able to sort of preserve these stories um, in a way that, you know, no matter where I've been and how much I've traveled or how much I talk to folks, I'm not quite seeing anything that is similar, um, which I'm going to sort of lead this into talking a little bit about Micah and his work in Tim Tum. Um, I can't remember when we got our copy, but my guess would probably probably be uh, around 2003, 2004, just as we were getting started with QZAP. Um, and Tim Tum for me was the first time that I had seen any real writing about being queer and Jewish in the same space. And growing up Jewish, one of the things that I had struggled with a lot was not seeing myself represented a whole lot. Um, right after 9-11, I was still in San Francisco and a group of the folks from Queeruption and I started going to Shahar Za'av, which was the LGBT um, synagogue that is sort of in the mission, uh, mission neighborhood in San Francisco. Um, and other than that, and the one that was on the Upper West Side in New York, whose name I'm forgetting now, like there just didn't seem to be a place for Jewish community. Um, and then when we saw Tim Tum, I was like, oh my God, this makes so much sense. Um, within the queer eruption community, fast forward a couple of years, um, the year that it was on Salish Coast territory, uh, which would have been sort of uh, Pacific Northwest outside of Vancouver. Um, hanging out at a, you know, this gathering of queer anarchists and radicals and whatnot. And folks coalesced um, a Shabbat service, just sort of out of the ether. It became a thing that happened one night. Um, and, you know, I feel like Tim Tum really got discussed a lot. Um, people saying, have you heard the, this scene? Have you seen it? Um, what does it mean? And so from that, I came back and was inspired to work on my own zine about what it means to be a radical queer Jew. Um, and, you know, I feel like when Libby had asked an email, you know, sort of what our connections were, this is what I keep thinking about. Um, and I've seen Micah's work in other places. Um, I feel like recently in Currents, did you do a, a, a piece for Jewish Currents within the last year or two? Maybe, I don't know, okay. Um, at any rate, um, as I'm getting ready to pass this over to Micah, um, you know, I feel like these are, you know, the, the intersections and sort of the links that being an archivist and being a zine maker have allowed me to make connections with um, and thus, to be able to come and talk to all of y'all uh, about what it means and, you know, without having advanced degrees, without having a whole lot of specific knowledge, um, you know, just an interest in reading and in my case, you know, playing with computers and making fun pictures, um, doing this sort of work. So, um, so I'm gonna just pass it, <laughs> pass the mic over and mute myself for a couple of minutes. Um, Thank you so much for that, Milo. Um, wow, this is, I'm already having all the feels. Um, Libby, I wanna make sure I don't take up too much time and we have time for Q&A. So when should I speak until? Just 
talk. Okay. Okay. Great. I, I, I do love a Q&A. So I'm, I was going to show some slides of my other work, but I might just skip that unless, unless people feel strongly and just talk about Tim Tum. Um, uh, so I'm speaking to you from Ohlone land, so-called Berkeley, California. I'm a 48-year-old white anti-Zionist Jewish non-binary trans queerdo artist, and I've been working for the last 25 years on and off with social justice movements to make art together that helps us reimagine the world. Um, and in that time, I've worked with so many incredible people to make art, and those relationships are really the bedrock of my life and of my practice. And our work together has gone all over the world. But the first project that I did that showed me how art has its own life was Tim Tum. And I made it when I was in my early 20s, um, 22 years ago. And it was really the start of me healing and understanding myself, which I was the bedrock, the basis, the foundation for all the work that I try to do now in solidarity with and service to other communities and my own community. When I was thinking about talking with you today, I was trying to remember what it felt like to make Tim Tum and to make something out of nothing. It's, it's hard to explain what it was like. Um, there just was hardly any public trans culture. I mean, anything like books, zines, films, websites, art. There, were, there was no internet as we know it now. Um, the few things that existed, like some of which were incredible, like Leslie Feinberg's Transgender Warriors and Stone Butch Blues, which if you haven't read them, please do, um, were just known by people in our very small subcultures. Um, it, it really is amazing how much the world has changed and that now we're in a world where there are trans and non-binary people on TV. Um, you know, and thinking about it, I also want to be clear that even though we see ourselves on TV now, this is not a linear progress story where things have now magically gotten better. I, I see Tim Tum as part of a larger story of a growth in transcultural production over the last 20 years, and I think it is a testament like all of your work, Milo and Kelly and everyone here of, of our incredible power to make change, but it's also, a, this is all a beacon of how far we have to go because the material conditions for most trans people have not improved. And especially for trans people of color, we are still fighting just epidemic levels of violence and incarceration and poverty. And we need to, uh, not believe the lie that because we may have a Google Doodle or a corporate pride parade or a TV character that we have what we need. And so I think it's our responsibility as white trans people, as some of the people who um, have benefited from these struggles to show up in solidarity with the most marginalized people in our communities who are the majority of our communities. So I see the visibility that we can gain through things like zines and culture as not the end goal, but as part of a bigger struggle to build power and improve the lives of all trans people. And for me, the first step in that struggle is being able to see ourselves and to see each other without shame. I was trying to remember what it was like as a young trans person coming up and 
until my generation, most trans people had learned that in order to survive, we had to hide. If we wanted any access to things like hormones or surgery or gender affirming healthcare, we had to go through doctors and prove that we could live in the closet, to prove that we could live as real men or real women. And even if we were not getting care from doctors, if we were getting hormones on the street, we had to hide in order to get access to education or jobs or housing. And for those of us who couldn't hide, people like Marsha P. Johnson, you know, and so many of our ancestors, that meant a life of constant violence and poverty. So I think that the climate, the context of creating Tim Tim was one in which it was very scary for most of the trans people around me to think about being out as trans, to even just think about not conforming to binary gender norms. And anything that we did to endanger that was seen as not just endangering to an individual, but potentially endangering the whole community because it was our survival was seen as based on being hidden. And at the same time, I was growing up in a family whose Jewish survival was based on being hidden. My father was born in Warsaw, Poland in 1927 and grew up in hiding in Nazi occupied Europe. And all my extended family was murdered by Nazis. And so there was just a very strong feeling um, as in many of our immigrant families that you anything that could draw attention to you, anything like political descent or art or gender nonconformity really was to be avoided at all costs. So, you know, of course they got me. Um, so, you know, for me personally being an artist and queer and trans were, things that were not okay in my family of origin and that I, when I was writing Tim Tim was really struggling with the pain of being ostracized from them and being ostracized from Jewish culture and trying to reckon with the pain of generations of internalized anti-Semitism and the history of my family not being able to live freely as Jews and the ways that my trans elders had not been able to live freely as trans people and starting to see how as white people, we are trapped in our own lies and shame about the history of white supremacy and slavery and genocide and how we hide that from ourselves, including the ongoing genocide against Palestinian people. So when I look back, Tim Tim for me was really the beginning of a lifelong commitment to unlearning racism and anti-Semitism and transphobia. And I see it as part of a global project by trans people everywhere, not just to win trans liberation, like you were saying, Milo, uh, as you know, an accessory within the current system, but to win gender liberation beyond colonization, beyond Christian supremacy and white supremacy, and to imagine a different world. It's interesting to me, oh, we have five minutes. We have five minutes. No, we're gonna continue. Okay, all right. Um, I, was, I was thinking about the context of speaking with you as zine librarians, which is such a pleasure, as we say in Yiddish, it's, it's, a, it's a mechaya. Um, and how Tim Tim emerged from our particular trans relationship with historical and visual archives, and how when as trans people, we were able to start looking at our own texts and traditions, we could see things that other people couldn't see. And I want to tell the story of my colleague, Rabbi Elliot Kukla, who encountered the term Tim Tim for the first time when studying the ba Babylonian Talmud. And he said to his teacher, what is this term that's used hundreds of times that seems to be talking about people who are not men or women? And his teacher said, oh, well, the Tim Tim is actually this mythical creature. It's a 
term. It's like a unicorn. It's something that the rabbis created in order to, you know, explore uh, concepts in Jewish law. But we knew when we saw that, we saw ourselves reflected. And we could see that Timtum was not just a myth or an insult, but it was a historical term proving that trans people are not a new aberration, but that we've always existed and that there had been worlds where we had been accepted and loved. In Judaism, as in many traditions, we understand time as nonlinear. And we understand that healing and knowledge flows backwards and forwards across generations. And I see Tim Tum as healing, not just to me, but to my ancestors and to all the folks who come after me, including many of you who I'm really just honored to be here with. Um, even though it's very dated now, and there's so many things I could update and correct in it. I'm just amazed at how many people have told me it helped them stay alive. And at the time that I made it, I barely made any copies. I barely did any distro. I can't believe that it got to Q's app and it got everywhere. I never intended for it to be to be digitized, but I'm, you know, after many years, made my peace with it. And I'm so glad that it is a force of healing in the world. And the way it got distributed, I mean, I remember bringing it to a local zine shop and they basically laughed at me, but other trans people got it and they made hundreds and hundreds of copies. And it somehow spread across the country. And um, now it's in like archives and publications. Um, but what really matters to me is that it helped people live. And I wanted to read to you an excerpt from um, Reina Yehuda Newman's beautiful essay about Tim Tom, which now this is a little awkward because Reina is here, but um, they gave me permission to quote their essay about finding Tim Tom when they were in high school. When I hold my copy of Tim Tom, I can feel the heat of white fire, the part of Torah that we reveal beyond the written word. If my house were burning, this scene would be one of the first things I would save. Tim Tum saved me and somehow was saved for me. It moved me to the point of creation hoping to pay forward for the next generation of nice Jewish queers and fagalas and Timtums and Jew fags and rootless cosmopolitans and cultural Marxists and those yet unborn and still unknowing who they are. I wrote my own zine because Tim Tum had given me a modality to speak. The rabbis wrote commentaries and we write zines. In the queer punk zine world, we used to say, zines will save your life. And in the Talmud, they teach us, when we save one life, we save the entire world. Thank you. Micah, thank you so much for that. Um, that was really amazing. Um, I'm, I feel really, um, I think all of us here feel really um, blessed and honored to share this space together. Um, and yeah, I mean, I'm sure you're seeing the chat too. I mean, just a lot of gratitude, thank you. Um, I, I wanna see if folks, um, folks may want a minute to sort of process, um, but if folks have questions um, that they wanna ask any of our amazing speakers tonight, um, please feel free to jump on in. I have a question. Um, first of all, whoa. <laughs> um, I'm not even like wiping my tears because I know more are coming. I'm just like really grateful I hopped on and found this and 
Yeah, Micah, I've been waiting for you to like do an online talk for a really long time. And so, and just been like consuming your work and been wanting to be more in conversation with you. So it feels good to finally be here because I feel like I've just been like going to your bio page a ton and I want to like be in spaces with you and not just um, seeing your work. So, but one question I do have for everybody here is, um, yeah, I mean, Tim Tum changed my life in a lot of ways. DIY art culture changed my life in a lot of ways. And now I'm I'm 24, I'm non-binary Jewish anarchist, and I'm working as a community artist right now. Um, but there's a lot of like stipulations to like the way that I'm working and ways that don't align ideologically for me. Like my position is paid through AmeriCorps. I'm working at a museum that doesn't fully, you know, support all of my politics and all the things and I'm just curious like how do you all feel like not like ideological purity but like how do you feel like you've been able to kind of navigate um like bringing in DIY and alternative culture into jobs or like your career or your work as an artist um without kind of like selling out or whatever um yeah like I just I feel like I've been trying to be very careful about ways that I use my art and who I agree to work with, but sometimes it's it's confusing. So yeah, I'm just curious if anybody here has advice on that. And yeah, I'm not an, I'm not a student. Someone just messaged that I'm not an Elon student. I, I live in Baltimore, Maryland. I would say that you, the institution needs you more than you need them. And there are ways to work within your workspace to promote your own, um, I don't want to say ideology, but uh, to do labor that aligns with what feels right for you. Um, and it, it might be little things every day, it might be bigger things every day. Um, but when it comes to making work, you don't necessarily need to work within an art space to create. And, and I, I feel like that's what zines and, you know, Q's app and library stuff in general has taught me that, yes, of course, within the spaces that we occupy where we're doing it for a dollar, um, because we need to eat and because we want to make enough so that we can fund other things. You know, sometimes you have to behave a little bit more nicely than you would want to. Um, but if you have the time and if you have the energy and if you can find folks who are like-minded, you can work outside of your institution and create something within your community. And it doesn't have to be big and it doesn't have to be splashy, um, but you know, making those little steps I find helps to give one a sense of balance. Um, at least that's, for me, that's worked quite a lot over the last 20 or 30 years, so. Um, Naomi, I, I'm happy to talk with you much more in depth about this one-on-one -on -one afterwards, so feel free to contact me, but this is, uh, you know, fuck purity. As our sex worker comrades say, we all work for the man. Some of us just have better shoes. So, you know, I have a lot of lines about where, you know, where I draw the lines. I do commission work. I do work that no one ever sees. Um, and I also really try and have a have gotten to the point where I can have a, a high bar, somewhat high bar about the work that I share publicly. Um, so yeah, it's it's a lifelong struggle. I really appreciate that, especially like as a younger artist, it's just really helpful to have older folks be like creating some clarity around the truth of our lives. So thank you. <laughs> I feel like I'm like <laughs> completely situated in working for for the man and it's all about carving out space that feels okay. Like, you know, I work at the Rubenstein Library as part of Duke University. Uh, I do reallocate a lot of my um, 
personal money <laughs> from my job to causes and organizations that um, are doing more radical work, like um, uh, Three Wave, um, that there used to be Third Wave Foundation, but um, they uh, are an organization that su supports like every every <laughs> every good radical cause, um, particularly around abortion, sex work, um, queer trans folks of color. Um, they have like a sex worker giving circle. It's really awesome. So it's like sometimes. And I'm just like feeling crappy about things. I'm like, okay, you're also sustaining the work of other people who are doing the things that you're, you don't have the space to do right now. Um, and I don't want to go in too much of it, but like, I feel like there's ways, like once you are established in your job and like, I do not, I like, I'm in a position of, I'm not precarious where I am. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, I can just like, I know where the margins are. I know where the work room is and I know who else to ask to do stuff. And so, you know, I'll start a document and be like, okay, I need X, Y, and Z to happen. Um, who, who's the right person to talk to the other person to make that happen? Like during COVID, I was like, this all fucking sucks and everybody needs a mental health day. Who could make the mental health days happen? Okay, so I'm gonna like, <laughs> call in the department heads that I know that uh, are like-minded and, you know, get them to talk to their department heads and then uh, like start like nudging things around. So like I had no conversations with anyone except for these folks about like giving people some space, but it, it did happen. And like, I don't take, you know, any credit for it, but it's just like, when I'm getting stuck, I try to imagine like, okay, what do I really want to happen? And then maybe there's some, maybe there's some movement there. And if there's not, then maybe, maybe that's something I'm not going to get from this role. Maybe that's something I need to find in another place. Other questions from folks? I'm also happy if folks would prefer, um, I can turn off the recording if folks would um, be more um, excited to ask questions without it. Um, and again, the recording is gonna be for, um, primarily for my uh, philosophy of archives and uh, sex and gender students who, um, many of whom are in class actually right now, unfortunately. So they really appreciate the recording. Um, but I'm happy to turn it off. I'll, I'll wait a minute and see if anyone else chimes in. And if not, I'll stop the recording. Um, I have, I have one, one question. Um, first of all, uh, to all of the panelists who spoke, um, thank you so much. It's really, it's really wonderful to see you all. Um, Milo, I've particularly admired Q's app for many, many years, and it's something that's made a huge difference in my life. And um, Micah, always, always an honor to see your work and hear you speak. And thank you for making me cry with my own words. Um, <laughs> that's remarkable. Um, so really nice to have an emotional evening. Um, I, I'm curious um, from, from all three of the panelists, um, thinking about, I always really like to think about what it means to imagine what are the best possible worlds that we could build. And I think in the realm of talking about archives and memory, um, I'm, I'm really curious uh, if you were all to have infinite resources um, specifically to do memory work and archives um, or creative projects, what would you want to build? And how do you think you would you would use those resources? Obviously, like if we had infinite resources, we'd be putting that towards like justice projects primarily. I'm I'm at least I would. Um, but if we had if we really had this for memory and archives work, um, I'm curious, what are the projects that you would want to build and what are the things that you would want to bring into being? I would take my infinite resources. I was going to type this in the chat, but I would basically give 
a million or two dollars to every black and queer archivist or <laughs> trans person of color who wants to work in archives and memory work and let them build what um what they envision because I uh I think the thing I learned <laughs> I've learned is that there's a lot of people who have much better ideas and I would I would love to be able to invest in seeing what magical things can be created when people other other people than me are resourced in a in a meaningful way. Um Oh, go. No, go ahead. Um, you know, Raina, I'm thinking about the, uh, I can't remember their name. There's an author who went into Eastern Europe and collected a lot of the folk stories from the shtetls right before the war. And um, anyway, I'm just thinking about the precipice of, our, of climate collapse that we're on and the um, knowledge that, indigenous folks have about how to live and in right relationship to the earth and our genders and so many other things. And um, like, it wouldn't it be amazing if there were resources to support um, folks to go into their own communities globally and record, archive the conversations with their gender expansive indigenous elders. Um, because I just am very aware of like, again, the nonlinear flow of history and that I feel we're going potentially into a time of, you know, more, um, we're, we're going into a hard time of collapse and we need those stories. Um, and things are not potentially gonna be as open as they are now in the future. Um, the other thing I think about is just how I came into being a movement artist through other generations of movement artists who shared how to make zines, shared their bootleg fonts, shared, you know, all their, you know, support and emotional love with me. And so, like, how can I share that with other, um, you know, emerging artists coming up? I think for me, what I would like to spend my infinite resources on is um, to help build out the digital tools for doing the archival work um, in a way that, you know, as Libby points out, exists outside of capitalism. So for us, we've had to reinvent a wheel because we have no funding um, and because we have a different knowledge set. Um, and we came to archiving in a sort of non-traditional way. And I feel like if there were open tools um, for all sorts of memory work that were very easy to build and to scale and to teach, um, I would love to see lots and lots of resources poured into having those tools be made available without, uh, without paywalls, without barriers. Um, and, you know, thinking, yeah, I think that, that for me, that would be a, a really big thing um, that could then be spread through all different sorts of communities and do all sorts of different memory work without, uh, without limitation. Other questions? Um, I come from another school as well, sorry. Uh, my name's Avery. Um, I come from uh, SMFA at Tufts in Boston. Um, and we have a small zine library that's inside of the SMFA's collection that is also a part of another library. It's like nesting eggs. Um, and we've been working uh, in cataloging primarily through the language given to us through the Library of Congress. Um, and I've been given the task of trying to find 
a way for us to self-identify uh, the content that we have outside of those very narrow bounds that are given to us. Um, and so I guess I was just hoping to hear if anybody had advice or opinions on, um, I don't know, what it might look like to have cataloging systems where things are self-identified because at least for myself, um, especially in the context of Tintum, um, I, I find that there's a lot of terms that don't exist in traditional cataloging language that end up becoming reference points in the future that are lost out on if we just use the existing language. Uh, and so I just was hoping to hear something on that. Um, so Kelly threw up Homosaurus um, and Zinecat, which is uh, a project to share metadata about zines in existing libraries. Um, and one of the things that's been happening within the zine librarian community for over a decade is this project to create a uh, union catalog for zines, um, where the idea is that it'll combine data from a whole lot of different types of collections, academic collections, public collections, independent collections like ours at QZAP. Um, and everybody has sort of different a different basis for cataloging things. Um, so what we've found is there is, um, homosaurus is something that has come up as a queer vocabulary that exists and that is intended to be accessible and able to be plugged into different systems. Um, for zine specifically, Anchor Archive in Halifax, Nova Scotia has its own subject thesaurus that is zine specific. Um, and it's been around probably for a dozen years or more. Uh, and they're currently working on revising it and um, updating it. So that project is one where they're seeking folks to volunteer on. Um, I think that there are lots of ways that you can approach uh, systems that exist and also bend them without breaking them. Um, you know, use the notes fields um, and put other information in, even if it doesn't pair up um, or work towards uh, changing Library of Congress subject headings. I feel like a lot of folks in our community do that sort of work. They petition, they write letters, um, things like that. I'm just spamming the chat with some, <laughs> some links. Um, uh, so I threw in a link, uh, Milo mentioned the crit cat hashtag, which you can, if you're a Twitter nerd, you can jump on that. Um, yeah, it's like, ask a librarian to talk about metadata and cataloging. Yes, please. Um, there's a bunch of folks working on this and that are, have a lot of energy and ideas that are behind it. But I so said, I think the, um, the links we shared are good. Um, Jenna Friedman is one of the folks in, who does cataloging of zines at Barnard Library and has a lot of, um, like keeps an eye on like new, um, like just thinks about ways to apply subject headings and self definition. So I, I really think that one thing that I've taken from zine librarianship uh, is like under, <laughs> under like, kind of navigating the space between, it's like, it's a publication, but it's not really a publication. Like I really enjoyed and appreciated hearing Micah talk about like, you made X number of copies and then it it had a life of its own beyond your control. Um, it was, uh, uh, you know, you, you publish it and it's not in your hands anymore, but there are some ways that it could kind of return to you. Um, uh, in conversations like this and and kind of deciding how you want to be represented. So um, yes, please just join the conversation. That's the last thing I'll say.
I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording just in case there's a last lingering question that we might have um, where somebody would prefer to ask without being on the recording. I also want to honor our panelists time. Um, we asked for an hour and a half and we are coming up on the last 10 minutes of that. So I'm going to stop the recording, but just as the last word in the recording, um, I just want to thank the three of you so much. Um, this was a really, really special panel and we really, really appreciate your time and your energy and the the beautiful work that you've created, which inspires me and inspires my students and inspires Libby. She's having a little bit of an issue with her microphone. So I'm just speaking on her behalf, though. Usually I'm I'm, I'm more skeptical about speaking for others, but I, I'm quite sure I can. Wait, is your mic working again, Libby? I made it work again. I snuck out of the meeting and snuck back in. Oh, good. So that's the last word for the recording. I'm going to stop it and we'll see if there's one more question at the end.